This Jewish History Podcast is dedicated for the Refor Shalema, for the complete and speedy and total recovery of Itra Basros, a dear friend who was recently diagnosed with cancer. Please include her in your prayers, Itka Bas Rose. It is December, and we are nearing the end of the calendar year, and I want to make a brief appeal for your support of Torch in 2023. Long-time listeners know that we have one annual fundraiser in the beginning of the year, the first quarter, and we try really hard to get everyone to make at least one donation to support the great work of Torch. We don't have ads, and our programs are open for everyone, and we really work really hard to disseminate Torah and and knowledge of Jewish history and Jewish values and mitzvos to the world, and we want you to be a partner. And every year we have a fundraiser, and we share it on the various podcast shows, and thank God the audience has been incredibly generous in supporting the annual fundraiser. But this year, as you know, I have been a bit absentee in producing new Jewish History podcasts. So I never made an appeal on the Jewish History podcast this year, and here it is. If you enjoy our work, if you enjoy the Jewish History podcast and many of our other amazing shows brought to you by the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, help us continue our great work by making a donation. Visit our website, torchweb.org. You can find the link in the description of the podcast and support the great work of Torch. And of course, my email address is Rabbi Walby at gmail.com. Learning Jewish history is important for all sorts of reasons. Of course, if you have a sense of Jewish history, that's a way to instill a person with Jewish pride. When we look back at the great personalities of our history and the great accomplishments of our people over the course of our history, it's something to marvel at. Jewish history it's replete with titans, with, with giants, with exemplars, with the greatest of our species. The story of our people is the story of a nation at the vanguard of global progress, of a nation effectuating seismic change in the world. If you want to be a proud Jew, one way to do that is to study our history. But history is not just there to bolster Jewish pride. It's also imperative if you want to know how to live as a Jew, how to think as a Jew. Jewish history helps you get a sense of the marching orders, of the responsibility, of the mandate of Jewish life. To know what we need to do as a nation, to understand what we as individuals are here to do, what our responsibilities are, we have to look back at our past. We have to study the vital mission that was entrusted to our people and to monitor our progress and to see how far along we've come and to get a sense of what we still yet need to do. Jewish history is also important because it gives context to the suffering, to the struggles, to the challenges, to the ups and downs, to the horrific nadirs of Jewish life. Today, a lot of American Jews, a lot of Western Jews, a lot of Israeli Jews, a lot of Jews worldwide and non-Jews, frankly, are dealing with the reality of rising anti-Semitism. And it's a bit terrifying for some. It's dangerous. There's been a huge upswing in attacks against Jews in this country. And I think someone with a basic understanding of Jewish history Such a person is aware that we've always been subject to some degree of anti-Semitism. And sometimes it's hidden. Sometimes it's suppressed. But sometimes it rears its ugly head and that terrible hatred becomes overt, but it never seems to be completely eliminated. A Jew, I always like to say, with a sense of history, always made sure to have a valid passport. You never know when you may need to abscond and find a new haven. And I think today with the outbreak of the war in Israel, of course this war that began with the brutal and and fiendish terrorist assault by Hamas, the terrorist organization that has ruled Gaza since 2007, their attack on innocent civilians, 
killing, brutally killing more than 1,200 men, women, and children, and seizing hundreds of innocents as hostages, this war and everything that erupted from this conflict, this gives us another reason why it's important to have a sense of Jewish history. This war is happening on many fronts. Of course, there's the ground invasion in Gaza. And there's a war beneath the surface in the labyrinthine Hamas terror tunnel network. And there's the war in the year, the targeted strikes on Gaza, on Lebanon, on the Houthis, and the interceptions from these places. And there are skirmishes in Lebanon with Hezbollah, and we hope that does not escalate. And there have been attacks in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, which is, of course, the West Bank. We call it by its biblical name. On the international scene, the geopolitical scene, the diplomatic front in Washington, in the UN, there's a war as well. Weaponry, munition. Israel wants some of those special bunker buster bombs. But there's another front that all of us are part of. All of us are almost on the front lines of this front. And that is the in the court of public opinion. All over the world, there have been rallies in support of Israel, in defense of Israel, in defense of Israel's right to defend itself. But there are also rallies in support of Hamas. I will remind you, Hamas is a terror organization that targets innocent civilians. And the real front lines of this conflict is really online, on social media. There's a war. And unlike the actual war on the ground, where it seems like Israel's making tremendous progress, and of course, taking tragic casualties along the way, and every soldier that's lost is a casualty, every civilian is a casualty, every Jew is an entire world as we know. But if you look at the boots on the ground and the tanks and the targeted airstrikes, it seems like Israel is making tremendous progress in their mission of uprooting Hamas. But on the other front, on the front of public opinion, the battle for the hearts and minds of peoples worldwide, I fear Israel is not winning. It's losing on the propaganda front. And of course, we can chalk that up to plain old vanilla anti-Semitism, and that's, of course, partially true. But there's another reason why Israel is not winning on the Hasbara front. And that's because of gross ignorance of history. When someone's aperture is very narrow, and they don't have a broad perspective, they can be very easily misguided and misdirected and misled. People say, Israel, they're occupiers, and that's why Hamas attacked. People could justify heinous crimes with a myth that Israel is occupiers. Anyone with even a passing understanding of the history of the region knows that this is just not true. Israel voluntarily, unilaterally withdrew from Gaza in 2005. The so-called disengagement, the Hitznatkut, as it's called in Hebrew. And they left. Israel took 9,000 Jews that lived in 21 settlements in Gaza, and they've been there, I will remind you, in a way that was sanctioned by the government. They pulled out of Gaza, and they handed Gaza to the Palestinians. And this was very controversial at the time, and it really divided the country asunder. But in 2005, so this is 18 years ago, Israel voluntarily left Gaza. They haven't occupied Gaza in 20 years. And they went so far as to destroy Jewish communities that had flourished in Gaza for decades. They dismantled their homes, they destroyed their shuls, they exhumed their dead, and they exiled them from where they lived where they had lived, I will remind you, in a way, in a manner, sanctioned by the government. So since 2005, Israel has not ruled, has not settled, has not occupied Gaza. And therefore, no one can credibly, no one with a sense of history, that is, can credibly claim that the reason why Hamas 
did this attack from Gaza is because they were occupied. They just weren't. Now, what happened in the aftermath of Israel pulling out of Gaza? How did the Palestinians repay their generous gesture? Well, the first thing they did was electing Hamas. There was a democratic election in 2007, and the Palestinians elected Hamas, which I will remind you in its charter, it's that the purpose of this organization, the reason for its existence is to eliminate Israel, not to have a two-state solution, to eliminate Israel. That's what they mean when they say from the river to the sea. And that began a decade and a half of, or almost two decades now, of, of indiscriminate rocket fire on Israeli civilian homes and towns. And all of life in Gaza, much of it, it's made possible by the Israelis. You know, who provides water to Gaza? It's Israel. Who provides electricity to Gaza? It's Israel. Who facilitates the flow of international cash? The millions of dollars a month that came from Qatar. Israel. Who allowed tens of thousands of Gazan workers to enter Israel and to work and thus to boost the Gazan economy? Israel. And Hamas does not, did not cease from raining rockets on Israeli civilians. And Israel allowed cement to enter Gaza, ostensibly to provide a better life for the local population. And Hamas uses it to build an enormous network of tunnels to terrorize the Israelis. And those laborers, by the way, many of them helped map out Israeli towns to better enable the massacre of October 7th. So to the larger point, how can anyone claim that Israel has been occupiers when they completely left Gaza in 2005? That's only if they are ignorant of history. If you want to have an informed opinion on the Arab-Israeli conflict, on the war between Israel and Hamas, on the war in Gaza, you have to have a sense of where things began and what are the events that happened in the past. Another point, those who are ignorant of history, they're going to repeatedly fall for fabrications. The Palestinians make a very big effort in media manipulation and propaganda. There's a whole cottage industry called Pallywood where they carefully choreograph Zionist atrocities and there's faked funerals and they even have hired criers, usually old women, to complete the set if the Jews maybe control Hollywood. Pallywood is dominant in this conflict. And they're going to lie, and the lies will be brazen and blatant. And there's even one memorable video where there was a funeral. And the corpse, the, the poor thing, killed by the Zionist aggressors. And to make matters worse, the, the corpse actually fell off the stretcher. What a disgrace. But miraculously, he was resurrected and climbed back on the stretcher. A miraculous resurrection in the Holy Land. You'll, you'll be surprised to learn that no new religion was spawned from this miracle. The Palestinians have, throughout history, repeatedly lied and deceived to advance their cause, especially in the cause of public opinion. And they find no difficulties in getting the international press to accept and to peddle their lies. You recall a few weeks into the war, there was an explosion at a Gaza hospital and immediately all over the world, headlines blared, Israel bombs Gaza hospital, 500 dead. And that was reported even by the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and CNN and Reuters and AP. Everyone's breathless about this sensational news. Well, it turns out the hospital was not even hit. It was the parking lot. And there were definitely not 500 casualties, a total lie from Hamas, which, by the way, all the numbers of the dead from Gaza, they all come from Hamas. Don't trust them if you, you wouldn't trust them if you have any sense of history. 
But of course, it gets lapped up by the international media. Oh, and it wasn't even hit by an Israeli airstrike. It was an errant Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket that landed in Gaza. Just, I know it's a little confusing. There's lots of terrorist organizations. The big one, the mothership, is Hamas, but there are all sorts of little ones, like Lion's Den and PIJ, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And they're also shooting rockets into civilian towns. And Israel provided video evidence and audio Evidence in the form of a call between two terror operatives. And the Pentagon concluded that this was a, a self-inflicted wound coming from a rocket from Gaza. Actually, about a quarter of rockets fired from Gaza towards civilian targets in Israel land inside Gaza and damage Palestinians. So the Palestinians blow up their own hospital and the international press is blaming Israel. And even if you issue a correction, the corrections, as we know, don't stick. The reputational damage can be done. In the words of Mark Twain, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to put its pants on. So Palestinians are these experts, these masters of the lies heard around the world And Israel is struggling to put its pants on trousers for our listeners who are subjects of Her Majesty the Queen. The Palestinians realized that the penalty for a lie is outweighed by their benefit, their propaganda benefit that they earn. And thus, Palestinians regularly accuse Israel of all sorts of outlandish crimes, total lies, but it finds an audience. Oh, the Jews massacred and they engage in genocide and they're poisoning school children and they're harvesting Palestinian organs. Lies, all of them, but they find an audience. And again, on this front, the propaganda front, the Palestinians are committed to it. And they even prioritize propaganda above the lives of their own children. In fact, the Palestinian arch-terrorist Yasser Arafat, he celebrated and he encouraged children to go face off, go go up against Israeli soldiers and, and tanks. And you know what? If they, if they die, if they get killed, even better. That will advance the public opinion against Israel. That will deal a formidable blow against Israel in the propaganda war. And anyone with a sense of history, you're always on the lookout for the fabrications, for the lies, for the propaganda. But those without a strong background in history, they're very vulnerable to be misled. And certainly if they're online where the overwhelming majority of the news that they will encounter, certainly on on social media, it's going to be pro-Hamas. If you're not schooled in history, there's a very high likelihood that you will be misled. And unfortunately, the ignorance is rampant. And this is even true, sadly, within our own communities. So many of our Jewish brethren have drunk the Kool-Aid, have gotten swept away into supporting our enemies, into supporting really their enemies. And there are young Jews who may have a noble inclination towards social justice and world peace and helping the poor and helping the underprivileged, and that's fine, and that's a Jewish sentiment, that's okay. But when they identify with our enemies when they rally and support Hamas, when they support the terrorists, that's traitorous. That's unforgivable. That doesn't mean that Israel is exempt of any crimes and it doesn't necessarily mean that you can ever criticize Israel. But if you turn your back against your brothers and sisters and go support the people that would kill all the Jews if they could push a button to do so, that's a terrible, terrible state. 
That's a terrible condemnation, really, of our communities. And part of the blame is with the lack of education. If we fail to educate our children, someone else will. If we don't give our children a sense of history, they're going to get a distorted view. If we don't instill within them a love of Israel, an affinity towards Israel, they may be swayed in the direction of our enemies. And to this end, I hope to dedicate a lot of time and effort to prepare presentations on the history and the backstory of the Arab-Israeli conflict and to try to address it from many different angles. So last time we spoke about the history of hostage rescues and hostage negotiations and ransoms. And the time before that, we spoke about the historical background of the Arab-Israeli conflict up to the end of World War I, so 1917, 1918, when the British codified their intent to work towards the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. That's the famous Balfour Declaration. And for the first time, there's a major world power that is endorsing the idea of Zionism. Today, I want to continue telling the story of the fledgling Jewish settlement in the Holy Land in Palestine after World War II, after the Balfour Declaration, when the British government stated their intention to effectuate a Jewish homeland in Palestine. We're going to focus primarily on what happened in the 1920s as the British declared their intent to help work towards a Jewish homeland. The Arabs are not happy about that at all. The Jews are trying to build out their infrastructure, and there is a lot of tension and a lot of violence that ensues. The British would not be the only ones who have a say in determining the future of Palestine. The victors of the Great War, World War I, the Allied powers, they would determine the fate of the captured Ottoman territories in the Paris Peace Conference of 1919. This conference marked the end of World War I and sought to establish a new international order. And lots of things happened in the Paris Peace Conference. There was, of course, the establishment of the League of Nations. This is the forerunner for the UN. And it was championed by Woodrow Wilson, the U.S. president. And he had a very ambitious plan for this conference. He had his famous 14 points that he would use to build a post-war world order. But unfortunately, he suffered a severe stroke that significantly impacted his cognitive abilities, and the delegation was really led by his wife, and the U.S. ultimately did not join the League of Nations, and lacking the greatest superpower, really, the League of Nations was dead on arrival. It did nothing to unite the world powers and prevent World War II. There was the Treaty of Versailles, which imposed very harsh terms on Germany, including territorial losses, disarmament, reparations, and many argued that that also contributed towards World War II and the rise of the Nazis. There were several new nations like Poland and Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia that emerged as a result of this conference. But for our purposes, one result of the Paris Peace Conference was the mandates system. And that was a plan to temporarily administer territories that formerly belonged to the now-defunct Ottoman Empire and to prepare them for self-government. So these were not permanent control, permanent administration of these lands. But the Lebanon and Syria, they were placed under under a French mandate with the plan to eventually transition towards self-government. Iraq was placed under a British mandate and Palestine was placed under a British mandate as well. Now, what lands were included in the British mandate for Palestine? This is very important. The plan included the lands on both sides of the Jordan River. The initial mandate included the lands, if you look at the map today, 
the, man, the lands that now contain the state of Israel, that's on the western side of the Jordan River, and the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Both lands were included. And the British very early on made a decision to designate all of Transjordan, i.e. all of the mandate on the eastern side of the Jordan. All of that would be for an Arab state with zero Jews. So these lands, if you know your scripture, they include many lands that were historically Jewish, the lands that were conquered by Moshe on the east side of the Jordan. All of Transjordan, which equaled about 75% of the land in the mandate, would be first designated for an Arab state, the state of Transjordan. Now it's called, of course, Jordan. And the Jews that lived there, they were forced to leave. So the bulk of the land in the British mandate for Palestine would be free of Jews. And if the Jews hoped to get any land, that would only be possible in the remaining 25% of the land on the west side of the Jordan. But unlike Transjordan, the eastern lands, which would be 100% for the Arabs, the Jews would have to share their land with the Arabs on the other side of the Jordan. So if you've ever heard someone saying that Jordan is the Palestinian state, this is the historical background of that position. The original British mandate, if things were fair, would be divided into two states, a Jewish state and an Arab state. Instead, 75% off the top went to an exclusively Arab state, and the Jews would have to slug it out with the Arabs if they wanted anything on the west side of the Jordan. And it's it's maddening that the British always seem to favor the Arabs, despite the Arabs supporting the Ottomans in World War I. The Jews supported the British in World War I. In fact, they fought against the Ottomans. During World War I, there was an army battalion raised in London, the Jewish Legion. This idea, the idea for a Jewish Legion to fight with the British against the Ottomans, it came from one of the great Zionist leaders, Ze'ev Vladimir Jabotinsky. He's the father of revisionist Zionism, which is today the Likud party. Him, together with a dashing, one-armed warrior named Joseph Trumpeldor. And these soldiers were bedecked with a Star of David ornamentation on their uniforms, and they fought against the Ottomans alongside the British. And this is a very significant development, because this was the first all-Jewish military unit that was organized, the first one, in about 2,000 years. And this would be a critical precursor of the Israeli Defense Forces. Ultimately, the Jewish Legion comprised five battalions and 5,000 men, including such luminaries as David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, Levi Eshtol III, Yitzhak Ben-Zvi, who was the first president of Israel. Both of the bands, David Ben-Gurion and Yitzhak Ben-Zvi, both of them had been expelled from Palestine by the Ottomans. And this legion participated in several of the pivotal battles against the Ottomans, both in Gallipoli and in Palestine. After the war, the legion was mostly disbanded, but a single battalion remained where their services were used in defense of the Jewish settlements and the Jewish interests in the land. So this is an example, one example, a concrete example of how the Jews supported the Allies in World War I. The Arabs supported the Ottomans, yet as they always seem to do, they, they lose the war but they win in the post-war negotiations. So 75% of the British mandate is quickly set aside for the Arabs. And the only lands left for the Jews will be the remaining 25%, which, of course, they would have to split with the Arabs. Now, the Arabs resisted any Jewish state in any part of the land. In fact, they did not even tolerate a Jewish presence in the land. The second-to-last mayor of Jerusalem under Ottoman rule in his 
speech to the King Crane Commission in 1919 said, quote, It is impossible for us to make an understanding with the Jews or even to live together. Their history and all their past proves that it is impossible to live with them. In all the countries where they are at present, they are not wanted and undesirable because they always arrive to suck the blood of everyone and to become economically and financially victorious. If the League of Nations will not listen to the appeal of the Arabs in this country, it will become a river of blood. This is a speech given by an Arab official. Of course, it's an abominable speech, dripping with vile anti-Semitism, but it is indicative of the Arab perspective on the fledgling Jewish settlement. And as evidenced by the Arab violence that ensued, he was not alone in his sentiments. In the 20s, there were many Arab attacks against Jewish people, Jewish settlements, Jewish property throughout the land. As the prospects of the Jews actually building a state, and as more Jews came there, the attacks intensified. In 1920, the Arabs attacked the Jews in a tiny Upper Galilee settlement called Tel Chai, and they killed eight people. And then they set the settlement ablaze. Among the dead was the aforementioned one-armed hero, Joseph Trumpledor, whose last words, Tov lamut ba'ad artsenu, it's good to die on behalf of our land, that became a rallying cry and a motto for Zionists the world over. In fact, the Galilean city of Kiryat Shmon, which is a very large city today, Kiryat Shmon means the, the town of the eight. It was named after the eight Jews who died defending Tel Chai from the invading Arabs. Now, Trumpledor was lionized in his death as a Zionist icon and songs were written about him and poems and his writings and his correspondences and his memoirs became published and joined the Zionist canon. And he was revered by both the right and the left, which is unusual. Typically, the Zionists fell into one political camp or the other. He was a hero to both. And in fact, the revisionist Zionist movement, they named their Youth movement, Beitar, after him. Beitar is short for Brit, the covenant of Trumpledor. In 1920 as well, there were the Nabi Musa riots. This was a terrible outbreak of violence against the Jews in Jerusalem's old cities, where five Jews were murdered and more than 200 were injured. And these riots were triggered by the soon-to-be mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al-Husseini, who incited the violence with an incendiary anti-Zionist speech, which was replete with false rumors. Oh, the Jews are attacking Al-Aqsa Mosque. They're attacking Muslim holy sites. We're going to hear more about this guy in a little bit and more about his mendacious accusations as well. And the Arabs begin to riot. And the British, who were there to protect the local population, they withdrew. And they allowed the Arab mob to attack the Jews and to loot their shops and to destroy their property. And Zev Jabotinsky, the founder of the Jewish Legion, he mobilized the force to come repel the Arab attack and to prevent further Jewish blood from being spilled. And then after the riots, what do the British do? They equate the aggressor and the defender, and they arrest Jabotinsky. Why? Because you defended yourself with illegal weapons. Now, they also defended al-Husseini for inciting violence. He fled bail to the other side of the Jordan, and he was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment in absentia. And Ze'ev Jabotinsky, who organized the defense of the Jewish communities, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Though a few months later, all Jews and all Arabs that were arrested and charged for this riot were released in a generalized amnesty a few months later. 
Now, after pardoning the terrorist Al Husseini for his crimes of inciting violence, the British High Commissioner of Palestine, one Sir Herbert Samuel, he appointed him as Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. So this is like the the Muslim religious leader of the city. And the British High Commissioner actually really wanted this because he had to rig the election to do that. According to the regulations that were still in place from the Ottoman times, the political leader got to choose who would be appointed the Mufti of Jerusalem. But there was a vote and he could only choose any one of the top three vote getters in the election. Now, in the election, Haj Amin al Husseini came in fourth, but Sir Samuel really wanted him for inexplicable reasons. And one of the top three vote getters was cordially asked to withdraw his candidacy, and that bumped al Husseini up to number three, and now he's eligible, and Sir Samuel selected him. Of course, predicated on a pledge to maintain peace, a vow that he would resoundingly repudiate. So the 20s are getting off to a rough start in Palestine. There's mounting Arab violence. And the Jews decide to establish a defense force called the Haganah, which means defense. There was an existing Jewish militia that was founded in 1909, Hashomer, the Guardian. But that was small and really regionally situated in the north. And the Zionist leaders recognized that there was a need for a national defense organization that would be responsible for all guard and defense duties nationwide. And this had to be a clandestine organization because... The British did not approve of it. They did not want any other organization to be involved in any elements of security in the land. But they were effectively there to provide security that the British would either not do because they were unable to do so or not do because they were unwilling to do so. And therefore, the Haganah had to work underground the procurement of weapons, the possession of weapons was banned. And they had to use all sorts of deceptive tactics to get arms. They purchased them abroad and they smuggled them in all sorts of creative ways, in beehives, in refrigerators, in agricultural equipment. The weapons were disguised as everyday items. They had vehicles with false bottoms and hidden compartments to conceal the weapons and the ammunition during transportation. And even once the weapons got into the land, the Haganah had to shuttle them from place to place in ways that I cannot talk about without imperiling the G rating for this podcast, but use your imagination. Now, the Haganah would take up arms defending Jewish towns and Jewish property and Jewish people, but also to advance the cause of Zionism. And this ultimately meant to fight against anyone that they deemed harmful to the cause, even if that person was a fellow Jew. So, for example, when the Zionist establishment saw the Jewish Dutch writer, Jacob Israel de Haan, and they saw him as trying to undermine the Balfour Declaration, a Haganah officer named Avram Tehomi, under orders from Haganah leadership, assassinated him in Jerusalem. And as the years progressed, there was also a lot of infighting between the Haganah and other paramilitary militias that operated before the founding of the state, primarily the Irgun, that we'll learn about in the future. And that, unfortunately, occasionally descended into violence as well. Ultimately, all these organizations will be folded into the IDF with the founding of the state. But before the founding of the state, the services of the Haganah would very much be put into use. So 1920, it's a year of fierce Arab violence towards the Jewish settlers. 
but it would be eclipsed by the violence of 1929. In May of 1929, Arab rioters, again instigated by the Mufti of Jerusalem, attacked many Jewish settlements in, in Jerusalem, in Petah Tikva, and primarily in Jaffa. For an entire week, the Arabs rioted, and they destroyed settlements and property, but also slaughtered 47 Jews. And the degree of violence is stomach-churning. They attacked Jewish pedestrians. They broke into Jewish homes and murdered Jews, even children, in their own homes with such brutality. In some cases, they split open the victims' skulls with clubs, with knives, with swords. And some of the Arab policemen, which were ostensibly there to maintain law and order, participated in the riots themselves, shooting at Jews, in one instance also attempting rape of a Jewish victim. And when some Jewish victims managed to escape from a building that was being assaulted by the mob, and they ran away, they were chased down and beaten to death with iron rods, with wooden clubs. Now, to be fair, there were some righteous Arabs that defended Jews and offered them refuge in their homes, but many witnesses identified their attackers and murderers of their fellow brethren. They recognized them as neighbors. This is a terrible escalation in in the violence towards the Jewish settlers. Now, in retaliation, the Haganah launched reprisal attacks against Arabs. This is also a first. And they destroyed Arab homes and allegedly even killed some civilians, though there were no Haganah members who were charged with any crime and many stridently claim that they are innocent of such a crime. It's important to mention the heroic action of a British officer, Major Lionel Mansell June, the commander of the Jaffa port, who is credited with saving a hundred Jews due to a very strong intervention to stop the riot. He dispersed some of the murderous mob and prevented further death. In the aftermath of these riots, Sir Herbert Samuel, the High Commissioner, he decided to reward the perpetrators. Samuel, who was actually Jewish himself, was always bending over backwards to accommodate the Arabs, to appease them, to grant them concessions. Instead of punishing the Arabs for their rioting, he tried to appease them by temporarily restricting Jewish emigration to the land. Perhaps he was naive, perhaps he wanted to quash any claims of partiality towards the Jews, Maybe he overcorrected for that. But Sir Samuel rewarded the Arabs for their violence. And again, this seems to be a pattern that repeats itself again and again. The very behavior that they sought to minimize, the British incentivized. And not surprisingly, they got more of it. Incidentally, one of the emigres that was sent away due to this temporary ban on Jewish immigration was a young woman who was emigrating from Milwaukee. Her name is Golda Meyerson, soon to be Hebraized as Golda Meir. She ultimately made it to Tel Aviv via rail transport from Egypt. Uh, But you will be shocked to learn that Sir Samuel's gesture of goodwill to the Arabs did not pacify them. Again, in November of that year, further Arab riots broke out in Jerusalem, resulting in more dead Jews, and again the victims were punished, and again Jewish immigration was slowed. And thenceforth, there was this rule that Jewish immigration would be subject to the economic absorptive capacity of the land. But notwithstanding all these restrictions against immigration— There were tens of thousands of Jewish immigrants who did manage to enter the land in the 1920s, and the building of the land continued. 
and the Jews invested tremendous resources and energy to build out the land, the infrastructure, the electric and the water works and the sanitation and the roads and newspapers and sports organizations and buying more land and establishing more towns and building more settlements and more communities and more moshavs and more kibbutzim, hospitals and other healthcare facilities and of course agriculture, irrigating the land, removing the swamp, draining the swamps, making the desert bloom again. Many have looked at the remarkable miracle of taking a desert and having it bloom once again. They look at that as a fulfillment of the prophecies, where we're told in the prophecies that the land will become a barren wasteland when absent of its Jews and will bloom and blossom with their return. I will remind you again that the Jews only built on land that was owned by the Jews. And they took great care to respect the rights of the Arab inhabitants. They perhaps naively believed that coexistence would benefit everyone. Building the land was not easy. It was hard. Many immigrants died of malaria. Many were unemployed. Many actually left due to the harsh economic conditions. But slowly and gradually, the Zionist dream was being actualized. And the building out of the land was not only in the physical and material elements of the land, but also in the spiritual aspects. In 1924, Rabbi Avraham Grudzinski, the exemplar of Slabatka, he arrived in the city of Hebron, Hebron, with a cadre of exceptional Torah scholars, and he founded the Hebron Yeshiva, which was a branch of the Slabatka Yeshiva in Lithuania. And as we shall see, these, we could call them spiritual emigres, they would suffer from Arab violence alongside the rest of the pioneers in a terrible and brutal way. Now, throughout the 1920s, the cycle of Arab violence towards Jews continued, but it was sporadic and episodic after 1921 until it wasn't. In 1929, a horrific set of riots and massacres were perpetrated against Palestine's Jews. And again, the culprit is the Mufti, Haj Amin al Husseini. He spread false rumors. There's a Jewish plot to seize control of the Al Aqsa Mosque, and they're attacking and they're killing Arabs wholesale. Like they say, you know, Hollywood loves sequels. I guess Pallywood does as well. These rumors were completely false. But Arab violence erupted on a scale never before seen with unfathomable cruelty and barbarism. Now, what you're about to hear, it's very intense. But it's important for us to know that the events that we witnessed, that we learned about on October 7th, the kind of brutality and cruelty and, and massacring of innocents that happened on such a horrific scale, that's something that happened before. It happened before. And it happened many times before. It's important to know that. In Jerusalem, Arabs started an attack on Jews in the old city. And while Jews were being killed at the Jaffa Gate in view of British policemen, they didn't open fire to the crowd. And throughout Jerusalem, Arabs rioted and looted with savagery. And the British did little to stop it. And they refused to arm the Jews to enable them to defend themselves. And they attacked settlements outside the city. They attacked hospitals inside the city. And they killed and destroyed and looted and burned homes to the ground. 
in the Jewish village of Moza outside Jerusalem. The Jews always had good relationships with the Arabs nearby. But that did not stop the Arab rioters from savagely attacking the Maklef family. And included amongst the attackers was the lone police officer in the region and even a shepherd that was employed by this family. An Arab shepherd who was employed by the family attacked and killed the people there. The father, the mother, a son, two daughters, and two guests. And the brutality, it's just inhuman. Mrs. Makhlouf, Mrs. Chaya Makhlouf, she was tortured by the Arabs, and then she was hanged. And the two daughters were raped and murdered. And one son, Mordechai Makhlouf, he survived by escaping out of a second-story window, and he was raised by relatives in Jerusalem and Haifa, and he later on became a great warrior and was the third chief of staff of the Israeli army. But the most brutal massacres that occurred in 1929, they happened in Hebron in Hebron and in Sfat in Safed. 67 Jews were killed in a massacre in Hebron. Hebron, of course, is the city of the patriarchs. That's where the cave of Machpelah that Abraham purchased from Ephron the Hittite for 400 silver coins, as is told in chapter 18 of Genesis. That's where Abraham is buried with his wife Sarah, Isaac and his wife Rebekah, Jacob and Leah are buried there. And at the time, Hebron, Hebron was home to about six, six to 700 Jews. And the Arabs unleashed a heinous, brutal, unprovoked attack on the innocent Jews of Hebron. Again, killing, raping, mutilating, dismembering, just absolutely vile, heinous, macabre, unimaginable things. And the accounts of this massacre, we have a lot of accounts of them. And it's it's hard to read. Such brutality. But I think it's important to know what happened and to perpetuate what happened. You have to know your enemy. You have to know what you're up against. You have to know what these people are capable of doing. Sir John Chancellor, who was the British High Commissioner, he took that post in 1928. He wrote in a letter, The horror of it is beyond words. In one house I visited, not less than 25 Jewish men and women were murdered in cold blood. Recall how the Slabatka Yeshiva opened a branch in Hebron in 1924. Many of the Yeshiva students were butchered and massacred by the Arabs of Hebron. The first one murdered was a 24-year-old Yeshiva student named Shmuel Rosenholz. And the attack began on Friday afternoon, August 23rd, 1929. And it's Friday afternoon, so most of the Yeshiva students were preparing for Shabbos, and the Yeshiva building was mostly empty. But this student, he was already ready for Shabbos, and he was studying Talmud in the study hall by himself. And the beasts... They crushed his skull with a large rock and they stabbed his body with daggers, thereby drenching the book of Talmud that he was studying, drenching it with blood. Now, there was a leader in the community. His name was Eliezer Dan Slunim. And he had somewhat friendlier relationships with the Arabs. He was the son of the old rabbi of Hebron, and he was a member of the city council, and he was a director of the Anglo-Palestine Bank. And they thought for sure, you know, the Arabs won't start up with him. And he offered the Jews to come stay with, with me. And everyone assumed that would be a place of refuge. And many of the Jews in the city, in the community, they took his offer for shelter, including 40 yeshiva students. Unfortunately, many of these people were eventually murdered there. The mob stormed his house on Saturday morning. And when they confronted him, they said, 
will we'll spare all of Hebron's Sephardic Jews if he just hands over the yeshiva students that were hiding in his home. And he, of course, refused. And they shot him on the spot. And they shot his wife and his four-year-old child on the spot. And then the monsters entered the house and began a slaughter of horrific proportions. And again, we have first-hand accounts, including one from a Gentile French author who wrote a book called The Wandering Jew Has Arrived. And he described the massacre like this. Here's the story in a nutshell. They cut off hands. They cut off fingers. They held heads over a stove. They gouged out eyes. A rabbi stood immobile, commending the souls of his Jews to God. They scalped him. They made off with his brains. One after another, they sat six students from the yeshiva and slit their throats. They mutilated the men. They shoved 13-year-old girls, mothers, and grandmothers into the blood and raped them in unison. And these descriptions are unbelievably cruel and brutal. And you read, you can read it online, you can read more descriptions if you are brave enough to do that. But they talk of castrations and terrible torture, mutilations, beheading of babies, disemboweling, burning people alive, widespread rape. And you get a sense when you read this, like this is the same thing that happened on October 7th. And it happened in 1929, almost 100 years ago, by the same people, attacking the same people. I want to mention some relatives of mine. My grandmother's uncle, so my great-great-uncle, his name was Rabbi Moshe Grudzinski. He was the brother of the aforementioned Rabbi Avraham Grudzinski. He was tortured before he was killed. These beasts, I have no other word to describe them, beasts, they tore out his left eyeball and they cut out his brain his blood was found splattered all over the ceilings and the wall. And his son Yaakov was killed with an axe to his head. And his daughter-in-law Leah was, was mortally wounded. And they brought her to the hospital in Jerusalem. And then she died three days, three days later. Now the British authorities, they launched a commission to report on these massacres. And here's a quote from the commission report. Arabs in Hebron made a most ferocious attack on the Jewish ghetto and on isolated Jewish houses lying outside the crowded quarters of the town. More than 60 Jews, including many women and children, were murdered and more than 50 were wounded. This savage attack, of which no condemnation could be too severe, was accompanied by wanton destruction and looting. Jewish synagogues were desecrated. A Jewish hospital, which had provided treatment for Arabs, was attacked and ransacked. The aforementioned High Commissioner John Chancellor condemned these attacks and called them atrocious acts committed by ruthless and bloodthirsty evildoers. Murders perpetrated upon defenseless members of the Jewish population, accompanied by acts of unspeakable savagery. In total, 67 Jews were killed, including 24 students from the Hebron Yeshiva. There were 480-some-odd survivors of this attack, and they were evacuated to Jerusalem. And in fact, the Hebron Yeshiva relocated to Jerusalem, and it still exists Today, in fact, it is one of the largest and most prestigious yeshivos in the world. As an aside, important to know, the Palestinian Authority, so these are the moderate ones, this is not Hamas, Hamas, they're, they're very radical. This, this group is, they're moderate. Led by Mahmoud Abbas, he's a moderate. If you could just get past his dissertation of Holocaust denial. 
if you just get past that, they're a partner for peace. Every single year, they celebrate these terrorists who committed these unspeakable crimes in Hebron in 1929. Every single year, they celebrate them and they commemorate them with a ceremony. And of course, we all wonder why, why is there no peace in the land? The final area where the Arab rioters massacred Jews was in Sfas, the iconic Galilean city. I want to read to you again from the Shaw Report that was done by the British Commission after the riots. At about 5.15 on the 29th of August, Arab mobs attacked the Jewish ghetto in Safed in Sfas in the course of which some 45 Jews were killed or wounded, several Jewish houses and shops were set on fire, and there was a repetition of the wanton destruction, which had been so prominent a feature in the attack at Hebron. And again, it was an orgy of macabre barbarism and brutality, just absolute butchery, mutilation, and murder. David Hakohen, he was a resident of Tzvat, and he would go on to serve in the Israeli Knesset after the founding of the state. He described the carnage in his diary like this. We went down alleys and steps to the old town. Inside the houses, I saw the mutilated and burned bodies of the victims of the massacre and the burned body of a woman tied to the grill of a window. Going from house to house, I counted 10 bodies that had not yet been collected. I saw the destruction and the signs of fire. The pogrom began on the afternoon of Thursday, August 29th, and was carried out by Arabs from Safed and from the nearby villages, armed with weapons and tins of kerosene. Advancing on the street of the Sephardi Jews from Kfar Meron and Ein Zaytim, they looted and set fire to the houses, urging each other on, to continue with the killing, they slaughtered the schoolteacher, Afriat, together with his wife and mother. They cut the lawyer Toledano to pieces with their knives. Bursting into the orphanages, they smashed the children's heads and cut off their hands. I myself saw the victims. Yitzhak Mamon, a native of Safed, of Tzfat, who lived with an Arab family, was murdered with indescribable brutality. He was stabbed again and again until his body became a bloody sieve and then he was trampled to death. Throughout the whole pogrom, the police did not fire a single shot. One final contemporaneous account from a missionary a Christian missionary who was in Tzfat, in Safed at the time. This is a quote. One of our church members came running to tell us that all the Jews were being killed. A few minutes later, we heard women shrieking their jubilant refrain from the Muslim quarter and saw men running with axes and bludgeons in their hands. Urged on by the women, we heard rifle and machine gun fire all around us. Wild Arabs had come up from the valley unexpectedly into the Jewish quarter and began at once a systematic slaughter of the Jews. Some escaped with injury only, but 22 were killed outright in the town. The inhumanity of the attack was beyond conception. Women were gashed in the chest. Babies were cut on the hands and feet. Old people were killed and plundered. By the end of the 1929 rioting, the death toll was 133 Jews killed by the Arab mobs. And again, I think it's important to know this because you you hear these descriptions and it sounds eerily similar to the events of October 7th. We have to know that this sort of behavior has happened over the course of 100 years it's endemic to the people who perpetrated it. There has been Arab and Muslim violence of this type for a hundred years in the land. And again, 
the the level of brutality and cruelty we we can't even fathom it's completely foreign to our people and truthfully to decent people worldwide and again in 1929 there was no state there was no illegal occupation there was no illegal settlements in 1929 what there was then is what there still is today a complete and total intolerance of any Jewish settlement in any part of the Holy Land. When they talk about the river to the sea, this is what they mean. And again, of course, it's not all the Arabs, we all know that. But it's enough for us to not ignore them. And there are people, many of them, I would argue most, but that doesn't even matter. They want the land, the Holy Land, to be completely empty of any Jews and will resort to unspeakable violence to do it. This happened within recent memory. Of course, the story is not over. The Arab violence against the Jewish settlers in the land, it was fierce and intense. In the 1920s, it escalated precipitously in the 1930s. And it became more organized and more coordinated and more deadly. And the Jews themselves failed to get along. They weren't really united. There were different factions amongst the Jews. And the British began to plan their exit and they sought to divest themselves of this mess. A lot happened in the Jewish-Arab relations in Palestine in the 1930s. And please, God, we will cover it next time on the Jewish History Podcast. Hopefully, in good health and in great spirits, please, God. Again, we are hoping and praying for good news from Israel. Our hearts are with our brethren in war, the hostages, of course, the soldiers, of course. May we only hear good news from the Holy Land. If you would like to support the great work of Torch, visit our website, torchweb.org. you find the link in the description. You could chip in and support us. And of course, my email address is rabbiwalby.com at gmail.com.